I do this every week. I don't know if I'm live or not until someone shows up. Is Ronnie live until someone shows up and says, hey, Ronnie, you're live? See my, see my antique chicken up there? It's a bank. That's where I'm saving all my money. That's why I'm uh, talking about money today. Here's the thing about doing live video that is just so funny is that you forget things, totally forget parts. Like I have notes and post-it notes around me. So like, oh, don't forget to say that. And this is part of the story. But one of the things I forgot to tell you about the Ivy Lee method, and if you haven't watched last week's about this, um, honestly, watch it. it. But if you watch it on YouTube, it's edited down to like 20 minutes. Anyway, the part that I forgot about the story, which is this kind of closing the circle around the Ivy Lee and Charles Schwab story is. So at the time when Ivy Lee said, give me 90 days with your executives and I'm going to change, you know, the course of how much money you all are making. Um, Charles Schwab said, fine, you know, so three months go by. This is the part I forgot to tell you guys. Three months go by and Charles Schwab sent Ivy Lee a check for $25,000. And in um, today's dollars, that would be about $400,000 that he found the value of that information. He just sent him that check because it worked so well for Bethlehem Steel. And if it's good enough for Bethlehem Steel, it's good enough for little old us. So anyway, that was the story I forgot to tell you. Um, but it dovetails to, with today's topic, which is about money. So I am going to get started. I, I may have, I, I hope I didn't oversell this to say, hey, I'm gonna show you four ways to make money, but I'm gonna show you four ways to make money. They are going to seem simple and I'm going to give you some direction on how it applies to running your creative business, whatever your creative business is. Um, but it, it, it's, these are four very simple concepts that we tend to forget. Our basic job as creative makers, doers, creative conceptors is to push our ideas out into the world and in exchange, people send us money for that. That is the super simple business plan that we have. I'm gonna do something cool. I'm gonna send out the world, you're gonna send me money whether that's in the tangible form, whether that is uh, in the written form, it, it is a digital form, whatever that is, that is our basic business plan. So simple, so simple. And I totally understand that the, my viewers um, are at different points on the road. Some of us are just exploring how to do this. Some are more seasoned. And some of us are maybe at a stage where you're like, I'm getting off this road at the next exit and I'm going to drink coffee and eat red Twizzlers and reevaluate all my life choices up to this point. And that's fine. That's fine. Sometimes we just need coffee and red Twizzlers. So I respect the fact that we're all at different places and some of these things may work for you. Some of these things will not work for you. So here are the four things. Basic. The four ways to make more money are one, increase your prices. Two, reduce expenses. Three, make more stuff. And four, get more customers. Now that seems really obvious and really simple. One of those four methods or all of those four methods are a way that you can make more money. And this is not to say that we're a bunch of slackers and we're not doing any of these things because we are doing them all to a degree. But sometimes we forget about ways that, other ways that we can increase our business when we think the only way is to do this one certain way that you're always doing it. Or thinking that the only way to get more business is to reduce your prices, which is not true. And I do not believe in that with some caveats, but we'll talk about that. Or you can ask me about that. Um, okay, so let's go with the first one, increase prices. So your first response is, yeah, but the market decides what the prices are. And yes, they do, and no, they don't. 
prices are often determined by that. But what if you're not at the right price? Maybe you're too low and you're not at what the market can command or you are more seasoned and more pro your work has proved itself in the marketplace, you can sometimes command higher prices. And so when it's just on price, it, there are fluctuations in there and you can determine whether you are on the low end of that or not. And we all know the danger of making all our decisions based on the price of something is that we end up, and this happens in a lot of businesses, not just our business, we end up chasing each other to the bottom. And that is a zero sum game. That does not serve any of us. So when you think about price, no matter what you're doing, whether you are making things for um, to sell at um, outdoor fair, um, whether you are selling surface pattern designs, whether you are selling your services like graphic design or illustration by project, all of those things can have a fluctuation in price. And there are two basic beliefs about price in, in the general business world. One is that if you haven't raised your prices in two years, you should probably raise your prices. Just that's normal. Other businesses do that. Um, law firms probably do that. And that they're, that, you know, you have more experience. There's, everything else has gone up. You know, if, if pr food prices have gone up, every, you know, everything's more expensive. And the expectation is no one's going to be surprised if you bump your prices up a little bit. So look at that two year window. If you're doing something, if you're doing the same thing you did two years ago and are better at it or have more customers, then you, you get to bump that up. You, you can choose to do that. And that's sort of on that every two year mark. The other thing is particularly if you are in a service-based business like you do or, or even part of your business is service-based like graphic design, web design, illustration for hire. When you have maxed out your available time, that is the time for you to raise your prices because you have, you can't, put anything more into that bucket of time, therefore you have become a premium person, if you will. So keep those two things in mind, that you don't always have to stay at the same price. And most of your customers are not gonna be wigged out about you raising your prices a certain amount because they did, they do, businesses do. So don't, so you need to uh, detach a little bit from that, but I have to be the cheapest one. We do not have to be the cheapest one. So there are different ways you can do that. You can um, just, I mean, even if you have an Etsy shop and, and you haven't raised your prices in two years, bumping everything in your shop up either by a percentage or adding a dollar to everything is probably not going to change your customer's decision about whether they're going to buy something or not, if you have something unique that they want. So you can just do that. And then theoretically, you'll just make more money right there because everything went up. If you have people that are price conscious and are moving away from that, then you'll make more money on the other people that aren't. They'll, they'll keep coming back. You know, it, so, so don't be afraid to raise your prices and just say, this is my anchor and this is where I am. And in two years, I'm going to look at this again, whether that's your design hourly rate or whatever that is, you get to raise your prices because other businesses raise their prices. Okay. You can raise your prices. Okay. So that's number one, increase prices. That's one method of making more money. The second is reducing expenses. Of course, we all know this. And, you know, I say that my poor husband, poor, poor husband, I often say, you know, Ben Franklin was right. It, a penny saved truly is a penny earned. Every penny you save, every time you make some economic decision of not spending something, that's you know, that's like money you don't have to make anymore. That all of a sudden makes that equation different because you have lopped things off. And we all know, I mean, everybody and their brother is, you know, trying to crack the code of the cable streaming 
Roku, all of that, what's the best way to do all that? And you, but we do that, we have to do that sort of on a lot of different things. How many subscriptions are you paying for, for either content or classes that you're really not using? And it doesn't feel like a lot, you know, it's like $15 a month or $18 a month, or you're supporting people on Patreon or whatever, um, which, you know, is a great thing. But you, there are places where the money is just kind of leaking out of your life. And that's where you can just say, you know, I'm paying for the subscription. I never go to the live events or I never do this. And so I'm just going to cut my losses on that. Or we just, things just leak out because we think that, oh, well, this is the magic thing. The other thing is, I mean, I've noticed this, I have a WordPress website and I have a bunch of plugins and some of the plugins have to be renewed every year. And again, not a pile of money, but if I'm not really using that plugin, should I pay another $39 to have it on there when I have to really look at it and go, okay, is there another plugin I could use that would do the job and not renew these things? So really look at some of those renewals as a way to just put money back in your pocket. So um, reducing your expenses is, is critical to this equation of how do I make more money? Um, some of us have, you know, an art supply addiction. Not that I know anyone that has that, but you know, we probably have enough art supplies to last us quite a while. And it may lead to new creative avenues because we're going to use some stuff that we didn't use before. And you know, if you put yourself on an art supply diet to say, let me see how I, can I go 90 days without buying any art supplies and see what you can do. Squeeze those tubes of paint as deeply as you can to get everything out of them. So really looking at your expenses really carefully with a scalpel and see if, if that helps you and start to gather that money that just keeps leaking out into a bigger pile to offset everything. I'm going to check comments. I raised my prices when I was a graphic designer, but I find in licensing that manufacturers are pretty set in their ways when it comes to royalty percentage. How do you deal with that? that, that I mean, that is truly a reality. And that is one of those things that they're sharpening. Everyone is really sharpening their pencils right now. So that might not be a place where this can happen. But when you have a little um, experience on the proof of the product, sometimes those things can be renegotiated or the next time you say, okay, remember that last product line we did and it was so fantastic? Well, here's our new deal. I mean, sometimes those things can be renegotiated. That is a, that's a tight squeeze right there for sure. I say, try it, try it. Cause you just don't know. Art supply addiction, Denise. Yes. Um, I've tried to donate this week and my husband and son-in-law saw them in the box. Let me take them out and keep them. <laughs> well, then try to use them. Try to use them for something else. Sometimes that can be a real um, a creative burst when you go, oh, this looks interesting. What if I use this stuff to do this thing? So that, that and that dovetails with another thing. So yeah, okay. So increasing your prices when you can, when it makes sense and paying attention to that, where, where you can do that, do that. Um, reduce your expenses wherever you can. Just, just think about Ben. Um, so the third thing is make more stuff. If indeed you have more things to offer, and I'm not, okay, I'm just gonna back that up. You know I'm not a fan of killing yourself working, hunched over the drawing table or the Wacom or the, iPad for 24 seven. That is not the life we want to live. However, we can probably crank out some more work. You can find either work on a style that's faster than what you're doing. Cut some corners. <laughs> I don't think there's anything wrong with cutting corners. And sometimes when you look at it, sometimes you think I'm cutting corners and then you go, wait a minute, I don't have to do all that stuff to get to here. So sort of look at how how you are working and see if you can do more work, do more of what is the thing, the, the thing that you sell or license. How can you do that faster and how can you do more of it? And that is really looking at, a lot of that is looking at your schedule. Okay, looking at how you work, finding techniques that might be simpler for you that 
don't really compromise your aesthetic or your voice or your vision, anything like that. Or find an additional way that you can do faster artwork, simpler artwork that might be for a different product line. And so working harder, I don't want to say working harder. I'm, I'm having a hard time saying this, but doing more work doesn't necessarily, do, producing more work doesn't have to be making more work if you're working smarter. And I don't know what that's going to look like for you. I know that there are certain go-to styles that I do that are way faster than other ones. And they probably sell just as actively as the ones that are more labor intensive. So sometimes when you look at that and you really start to look at your method of working and the styles that you are offering, you can start to say, you know, this one's kind of faster or developing something new that is faster, simpler, cuter, whatever that is, but making more stuff will probably get you more work because you have more to offer. So that is one, an, one of the four ways to make more money is to make more stuff. You just have more to offer, which dovetails us perfectly for number four, which is get more customers. And, you know, we are, as we have discussed, we're just not that great at the sales piece of this. If you know anybody in your sphere of people that you encounter that are in sales, they sell pharmaceuticals, they sell cars, they sell shoes, they sell on the wholesale level. Every salesperson on earth, if their job title has the word sales in it, they have to meet quotas. And part of meeting quotas is that then the company can plan for their budgets. They can plan on, you know, projected income because they have quotas. Uh, you know, phone banks of people calling people to sell them things over the phone have quotas. And the theory being, and it's not a theory, it's been proven, this is why people have sales quotas when they're in the sales business, is that you make a thousand calls, there is a percentage based on what all these people know that are probably going to turn into a sale. Now, we don't know what that number is of how many people we have to reach out to in order to make ourselves a dandy living, but it's probably more than what we are doing now. Would you agree with that? Because I kind of do. And we're all bad at it. I mean, it just is, you know. But if you want to make more money, this is probably your most expeditious way to get there, is to increase your activity of talking to human beings that can bring money back into your life. So it might be in the case of creative visual artists is that you start to identify new markets. You start to identify new categories that you have either ignored or you just were like, eh, I don't know. <laughs> well, try it, you know? And so I, I think it's interesting, uh, you know, I, I paint and, and I've been working on, so how, how do you sell a painting? You know, that, that, that's a whole other deal. But, you know, one of the things is, is like, well, what if the market is high end um, real estate agents and, uh, interior designers. Maybe I go that route instead of the gallery route. Well, that's a whole other way of working, but you can still go the gallery route. And so there are different avenues in which you can look at and really seriously look at, maybe you've ignore, been ignoring some of those markets and categories that you up to this point were like, eh, not so much. Now, of course, because the number three is making more stuff. If you're making more stuff, all of a sudden you say, oh, that might be really great for this category or this market that I didn't have anything for before. Therefore, I can expand my worldview and more people can see it. So that, that's the really obvious thing that you can do to make more money is to get your stuff in front of more people, get more stuff in front of your regular people, and then you have more stuff to, to offer the new people. Um, and maybe do something like give yourself like, you know, okay, the best day of the of the year to buy a, okay, there's four best days of the year to buy a car. That is the last day of every quarter <laughs> because those people need to make their numbers. You go in there and go, 
yeah, I'd like to talk to you about buying a car. They will be very open to making a deal with you. So, but they go on a sales blitz. I mean, car sales, you know, they, they, they do more advertising at the end of a month or at the end of a quarter and they do a blitz and they sell cars. If you said, okay, I'm going on a blitz and just, just make yourself do it. I'm going on a blitz. I am going to reach out to 50 people in the next month. Okay, say you're, you're, you're gonna give yourself a quota of, I'm gonna reach out to 10 people this week. And if you did that for four weeks in a row and just said, I'm just gonna go blitz this thing. If you reached out to 40 people with your artwork, with your creative ideas, do you not think that out of those 40 people, somebody's gonna go, that looks interesting, let's have a conversation. And so sometimes if you're trying to make more money, you just have to bite the bullet, swallow the frog, whatever metaphor you wanna use and do a sales blitz and just get out there and get yourself in front of people. So I, th I think that that is a really, that's probably the one that we're, I, I don't like to use the word weak because that's such a negative word, but that is where we all, fall down. It's sometimes we go, I'm just going to do a bunch of artwork. And you know, that's a fine idea. That is a fine idea. I talked to someone at Blueprint who said, uh, if artists just, you know, went home and did more Christmas, we'd be happy. And so sometimes you just got to go, I am going to crank on Christmas or whatever that is. Give yourself an assignment and crank on that. If you want to make more money, if you want to make more money and you don't change any of these four things that you're doing now, you're probably going to make the same amount of money or less because everything has some diminishing returns on it when it's not being uh, pumped up, when it's not being uh, replenished. So doing what you're doing right now will eventually start to dwindle. So you have to do one of these four things. So let's review. And then I'd love to answer questions. I know there's a bunch of comments and I will go over there and read them out loud. Uh, increase your prices in any way that you feel right about. And even if you don't feel all the way right about it, it's okay to do it because that's normal in business to raise prices. Reduce your expenses. Really look at the place where things are leaking out of the studio. Subscriptions are one. I know a lot of people. Okay. Here's one more tip on the expenses. In this world in which we live, we are constantly bombarded by people wanting to sell us classes. And that is fine. We all need to increase our education and I sell classes. Totally understand that. There is value in that. But what I want you to do, and even if I put a class up that's not on Skillshare, I want you to do this. I, I want you to promise me. In fact, I'll ask you if you've done this, if you um, are interested in my class. And that is when you go through that beautiful landing page and there's all the testimonials and they're telling you this is the only program you'll ever need, which I will never tell you. It's the only program you'll ever need. This is everything is just plug and go and you can do this and blah, blah, blah. And here's the price. Oh, that's, and there's limited time offer. Mm -hmm. I want you to take 24 hours, whether that is a $19 thing or a $2,000 thing. Okay, if it's a $2,000 thing, take three days to think about it. But even those $19, $37, $99 classes or books or programs, those, if you never use them, are a complete waste of time. You might as well just take $20 bills and tear them up and throw them out the window if you're going to buy classes and not take them. That is such a place where we get sort of like, oh, that's all I need to know. That's what I can do. And it's only $99. And what's $99? Well, we go out to dinner a couple times a month. Stop and wait 24 hours to do that. Okay. So that was my last thing. See, I forget things and I have to make sure that I get them in because I want you to know this. Okay, that was number two. Watch those expenses really carefully. Where Whatever your um, crutches of wanting to spend money to make yourself feel better or thinking that there's some magic, um, there's some magic to whatever someone's trying to sell you, really think about that think about that and get out of the things that you're already in that you might be paying for monthly and look at all those little software things and plugins and all that and rethink that. Okay. Number three, make more stuff, make more stuff that makes sense, make more stuff that you can do quickly. 
find the economy of scale for yourself of how long it takes you to do something. If like, say you're going to do like a big Christmas line, you know, and you know, you find a way to make it work. You know, most of us are pretty good at that, but really think about your processes. Think about how you can scale things back. Think about things you could eliminate. Like, okay. I have mentioned that I've done like 20 adult coloring books, which is a crazy amount. So it, you know, and each one has, you know, 36 pages. That's a lot of black and white artwork. Well, I got really fast at because I used to like do all the sketches on paper, scan them in, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh no, I just go right and sketch right on the computer and everything goes. So I, I eliminated one whole, like a couple of steps on that. So really think where you're doing that. And if you can eliminate some of those steps, I mean, I was able to produce so much more when I got better at that and by using um, a software that just made everything super easy. Well, not easy because I still have to come up with every one of those pages, but and had to draw them. But my process got a lot, t a lot tighter. Okay, so make more stuff. Figure out if there's a way that you can do that, and then of course, get more clients, get more customers. Put yourself pretend like you have to sell a hundred cars this month <laughs> because it's the equivalent of selling cars. And so get yourself out there as much as you can. Do a sales blitz. Put yourself on a, okay, 30-day deal. And if I, you know, and if I meet my sales goals, like if you say, I'm going to reach out to 50 people this month. And if I, you know, give yourself an incentive, just like the car dealers, like I get a ham, you get, <laughs> you could say, I'm taking a week and all I'm going to do is draw pictures. I will not sell for a week. Do whatever it takes to get your prize from your sales splits. So those are the four things. And seriously, I know it's within your capacity to do all of those four things. So now I'm gonna go look at comments and see if I can answer some questions, but please ask me questions. Erica, if their prices go up, I guess that means your price kind of goes up by default since it's a percentage of the whole. Yes, basically, yeah. Sometimes less, Jen says, in design really is more and helps you free up time to create more. Absolutely, absolutely. Sometimes simplifying things can really, and you know, we all have a tendency, and I think I blame Adobe for this, <laughs> is that we can rework so much. When we were actually painting things and had to make it work, we were good with a lot of stuff. Now it's like, well, what if the background is blue? What if it's a gradation? What if it's this? What if it's that? Stop when you are like, this is cool. Stop there and don't give yourself 15 more versions of the, this is still cool. And now I don't know what's cool anymore. So be very careful with continual revisions. That, that is a trap. Get more customers is the hardest of all four. It is, it is, but it's probably the one that will bring you the most uh, back. That and not taking any more classes. Uh, blitz marketing days. Yeah. Research the folks you pitch to for sure. Yep. Deck the halls, Annie. I know you are the Christmas queen. Um, sales pitching stuff is my biggest struggle. I'm just trying to wrap my mind around posting more on Instagram. Yeah. And you know, I truly believe that you can pitch with a three sentence email. Yes, you can do a three sentence email. Basically, here, I'll give it to you. Hi, Joan. I'm an illustrator. Uh, this is what I do. This is why I do it. I'd love for you to consider my work. I think that your coffee mugs are the coolest ones on the market. I love Ronnie. I mean, you don't have to give them that much more than that. And if you do that over and over and over, authentically, you know, Getting your words down that explains what you do and why you do it and, you know, what that's about. That can be a sentence. And one sentence to say, I love you guys. <laughs> In some way, this isn't, I love you guys. Although I've written emails that said, I love you guys and gotten deals. Hundreds of contacts from last year is exhibiting at Surtex. Also on artlicensingshow.com. Yeah. You just, you just have to do it. And, you know, when we talked about the methods last week of, do, of organizing your to-do list and doing this Ivy Lee method, 
which you guys got to watch that. If you haven't watched it, watch it. Game changer. But if you, it, you just put it in there, do five emails and make little boxes and check those babies off. It is a great feeling. And you know, we know it's a hard slog and the returns are difficult at best, but that's the only way it happens. That is the only way it happens. Even if you have an agent, if you have an agent, that's what they're doing. That's what they're doing. And so it, it, it's just part of this and it doesn't come naturally to us, but it's doable once you kind of, you, you just got to crack your own code and make your, you just got to make yourself do it. I mean, who likes to floss their teeth? Who likes to floss their teeth? Nobody. Okay, I know one person that really finds it satisfying. And yes, we all find it satisfying, whatever. But sending a bunch of emails is really satisfying too, but nobody wants to start it. Everybody's like, hey, I've lost my teeth. Okay, what if you get no response from the AD at all? Keep at it. Yes, yes. Um, we know for a fact that art directors are very busy people and they are not necessarily, that's not their first priority is to return an email to you. They might say, ooh, this is cool stuff, I like this, but oh, I just got called into a meeting or whatever and then it scrolls up and doesn't happen. So if you consistently and gently show up with them periodically in some sort of regular fashion, they really want that. They really want that. If you are bombarding them constantly or berating them for not getting back to you, which I've certainly gotten emails like that when I was an agent, um, that I didn't get back to them you know, within 10 minutes, give them some, you have to be a little bit patient on that. But if you're doing this in a systematic way and sending artwork, you just have to figure that they have seen it they just haven't been able to respond or it's just not right for them. And that's their policy to not get back until they go, Oh, this is so cool. Or until they tell you, you know, thank you so much. Appreciate it. But I don't think this is a look that's going to work for us. And then, then you're off the hook. Then you're off the hook. You get very few of those emails really. Um, unless, you know, and, and that's part of what it is, is you are, when you're doing this process, you're really curating who you're sending to. And you want to make sure that there's a, a modicum of a chance that your look aligns with their, their look, their attitude, their customer base. And, you know, we all know that that only happens with research and understanding who they are. I'm not saying that you should do a blitz and just send work willy nilly out to anybody. I'm saying that you should still curate and get in front of the people you want to get in front of in a much more uh, consistent fashion than you have been in the past. But if you are really wanting to make more money, that has to be a big part of the equation. That has to be, particularly if you are fairly new to this business, if you're fairly new to this business and you've got sort of a giant portfolio that not a lot of people have seen, it's time the portfolio development is done for this moment and the sales piece needs to get implemented, just totally implemented at that point. And then you can go back to drawing pictures. But if you want this to happen and you want to elevate, you want to make more money, that is probably, I mean, I think that these are all weighted fairly equally probably the reducing expenses, we can only do so much and you know, we don't want to live in a hollow tree, but sometimes, you know, desperate times come for desperate measures. And if it's a nice enough tree, it's not so bad. Karen, I like to floss. Good, Karen. I'm sure your dental hygienist is quite pleased with you. And so that's good. So maybe you can take that same analogy of, I like to floss to say, I like to sell my stuff. Uh, I find that handwritten notes have gotten the best agreements going. You know, Laura, sometimes that is the way to go. Sometimes an old school kind of way, sending stuff out, going, you're awesome. You know, I mean, people do postcards. You can write a note. And, you know, I think that 
you know, sending an email after you meet someone at a trade show or something like that in some capacity, fantastic. A handwritten note, a little better, a little better. Always the handwritten note when you can. And certainly as a thank you, certainly as a thank you. When someone has gone above and beyond for you or introduced you to someone else, do not forget the note. But Christy, yeah, simple. Just simple, because they don't have time to read your whole biography and go, and then I'm inspired by blah, blah. You know, it's like, that's great. You can have that conversation when they're all celebrating your big deal and they go, so how did you get started? And then you can tell them all that. But at that point, they just want to go, yeah, cute stuff. We can use it. You're adorable. Move on. Always. Okay. And I wanted to mention, I did, um, I have an interview up with our industry pal, supporter, best friend ever, uh, cherished leader of just many qualifications. I have an interview with her up and um, that's on YouTube and just scroll down from this video and you'll find it. And she is just a font of enthusiasm and information and some really great tips on time management, which are really good stuff. So watch that. And I have been interviewing several people that I think yeah, I'm so excited about. So the interviews show up every other Tuesday. And so those I just post at three o'clock on Tuesday. And I always just give you the heads up on here on Facebook. Um, but they're always on, but they're all up on YouTube. If you just want to sit around and drink some coffee and watch me talk, you know, you can watch them 10 times in a row if you want. I'm coming in late, but is a format that ADs like for approaching? Karen, I didn't really address that, except that simple emails are always the best way to go when you are reaching out. That, that is the easiest, most expeditious way to get a hold of someone and to, you know, state your case and let them know who you are. Um, I can't speak for all art directors. I just can't because see the difference is, you know, we're all artists. We're all trying to do this thing and we, our methods are basically the same from one artist to another, to another in this realm and e even artists in general, the art directors are all different. They're in all different businesses and their method of either gathering art, making decisions on art, who the players are, are really different. And so there is no hard and fast rule about what art directors want because they are all different. They're all on different schedules and different people are making decisions. Sometimes it's the owner of the company that's making a decision. And sometimes the people that you think are decision makers are actually gatherers and that they will bring the artwork to the other people. And there's this big um, meeting and you know, it's a giant process. And so, how they collect materials and how they want to see things, you can only do by experience and to say, how do you want to see things? Because that's how you find out. And do not be afraid to ask that question. Even if you send out sort of a cold email that says, hi, I'm Karen, I do this kind of work. Um, I would love to work with you. Here is a link to my website. And by the way, is this a good way for me to reach out to you? I mean, you can ask them that question or say, would you like me to send you a PDF that showcases this collection or my Christmas or whatever that is? And so you can ask them that question. Again, they're busy. You might not get an answer and that is soul sucking, but you can ask them that question because they are all different from each other. And uh, we forget that. We forget that, um, that they're different people but we are very much, we, we kind of do business the same way. Okay. I am thrilled that you guys are here. This is always super fun. And I hope that this one was valuable for you. Um, the money thing is always so hard. And I know I've gotten a question in the past of, so how, who's making money <laughs> and how much are they making? And again, I'm not really privy to that information. Um, you know, people just don't talk about their income that much and the expectations are, they're so wide, you know, from people's experience and the markets they're going into. And so it's really, it's a tough nut to crack and it can only be how you are going to do it, how, and, and what your, what your standards are 
of success. Some people are like, hey, I'm good with if I make this amount of money and there are other people be like, what? I couldn't possibly live on that amount of money. And so it really is, it's kind of a mushy question, but we're doing this for the money. And if you are doing this for the money, you need to figure out how you're going to maximize your time, talent, and exposure to do that. So that, that is my message for today is that, hey baby, here's the deal. <laughs> And so I hope this was helpful for you and I hope it was loving and supportive because that is what I want for you is to feel like this community is there to say, yeah, this, some of this parts of this business are really difficult, but we're going to figure it out and we will help you figure it out. So I thank you again from the bottom of my heart. I am so glad you're here. I will definitely be here next Thursday with a new topic or a variation on this topic, because I know this is a big one. And, and really, if you have any questions, please put them in the comments. Happy to, um, happy to answer as I can, or help you find a resource that can answer the question better than I can. And if you are watching this on YouTube, love it if you subscribed. And thank you again. I am thrilled you're here and cheers everyone. Stay caffeinated. Bye.